chandeliers and bipods. Pour yourself a tall glass of eye relief. Delay the blowback on your ballistic boar snake. And hammer your halfcock until your barrel is red hot. This is my talk told to me. There are many like it, but this one is mine. <laughs> Welcome back. I am Omen Thomas Sade. And I am Nick McGill. Together we are Feckless Momes. And this is Talk Tall to Me. A live fire exercise at the firing range of Prog Rock in which Nitroglycerin Nick and Offset Mount Omen will disassemble, clean, and reassemble every single song that Trigger Finger Rock Band Jethro Tull has ever forged. We will muzzleload Martin Barr's magazine. We will firmly grip the charging handle of Jerry Conway's stripper clip. And we will go plinking with David Pegg's powderhead. And if we aim and set our pod sights well, we may become the trunnion target of the fluted barrel bard, the bayonet of Blackpool, the ramrod of rock, Ian Double Action Anderson. The bayonet of Blackpool is one of the most badass things I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, that would be not a bad nickname. It's really good. Uh, fire in the hole, Omen. Hello. Fire in my hole. Ooh. Nick, hello. It is a, It is glad to be back. It is. It is glad to be back. You're right. Yes. Full disclosure, I have not slept very much in the last couple of weeks. That's right. Omen is... Uh, Omen, why don't you tell us your situation right now? Ah, the sitch. Yes, I am recording from a new place. Um, My wife and I, darling Katie Lou, and I just purchased our very first house. We are home owners. You're beyond the purchase. You just moved into said new house. Uh, You know, the dates of things are a little vague. Who's (laughs) who's to say which happened first? (laughs) Probably the law. The law would say that you bought and then moved in. Well, let's let's say that that's what happened. (laughs) Let's just have it on record here. For the sake of legal purposes. (laughs) Nick, yes, here. So here I am. I'm surrounded by boxes. And as as a lovely break from unpacking, I am super excited to listen to and talk tall about Another song. Not only another song, another brand new song for you, Omen. What? Oh, you shouldn't have. What a lovely housewarming gift. It is. Um, I would definitely water it immediately and, and put it in the sun. But other than that, like, yeah, it's it was my, my pleasure, my treat to get you this. Before we jump into talking about and listening to a song, Nick, anything to say? Or should we put it straight into our ears? Let's let's cram it in our ear holes. Let's listen to the second to last of our bonus tracks off of Broadsword and the Beast. We're listening to I Am Your Gun. That's right. Released in 1988 on the 20 Years of Jethro Tull commemorative boxed set. Later released as the bonus tracks on Broadsword and the Beast. Here we have I'm Your Gun. Here it goes. <laughs> Okay, Omen, full disclosure, you have you have read the lyrics prior to this, obviously, but you had not heard this song. So being fresh and brand new, so fresh and so clean, what are your thoughts? Well, first I want to clarify that I am neither fresh nor clean, <laughs> but that experience was very refreshing. Okay. Yeah, great. So it's it's really interesting to to look at this in the context that it came out in just reading in in silent singing about the 20 years of Jethro Tull commemorative box set mm-hmm. and it was it was the first big release of what Ian refers to as flawed gems this collection of stuff from across the years and you know some of the stuff that we've been talking about lately overhang too many too they're all from this uh from this set mm-hmm. <laughs> he he says It was fascinating to mix and master this collection, then transcribe and listen to these flawed gems from my past. Nothing changes the fact that they are still my babies, though. Hmm. I just don't hope 
They all show up for Christmas lunch. <laughs> yes, I think I've heard him refer to. I think I think I've heard him use that line before. I think so. Yeah, sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah, it's great. It, it, this is a cool song. I. It does feel a little rough around the edges, a little, a little unpolished, perhaps, mm-hmm. but it's got some really great material in there. There's, it, it's the roughness that I hear in it. I attribute to it having been, you know, kind of a, a, a tester, not fully fleshed out, not mm-hmm. fully practiced, perhaps not, not polished up. And, and it's especially detectable in Martin's guitar, where there is that oh. sense of, you know, kind of a fun sloppiness almost. And I, mm-hmm. I don't use that in it at all with a negative connotation, but just, it's got that kind of loose feeling to it. Yeah. Which is great. It doesn't feel as unfinished as Rhythm and Gold did, though. No, absolutely not. But I, I, but again, we're getting back into that territory of was it actually was Rhythm and Gold actually unfinished, or was it just intended to be jarring and asynchronous? But this this one is this one is back into the 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 flow of things where it's all everybody's kind of playing together and we're 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 back doing our thing with the the tall family. Yeah. You know when we talked about overhang, we kind of talked about how you could almost imagine that that could be a song by another band because it is so sure. straight ahead rock and roll. Mm-hmm. This song kind of tricks you into thinking that at first. Mm. Cuz it comes in heavy, it's like, "Oh yeah, this is rock." You know, this yeah. is like hair hair band. And then you realize how complex the chord structure is. Yeah. And it's it's moving all over the place. And so that kind of that, you know, heavy rock and roll drum beat and the and the bass being really, really, you know, funky and and fun brings you into brings you into that mindset. And you almost don't realize unless you are really listening to it that the that the chords are modulating all over the place. And mm. it's a very complex piece of music that's being quite expertly if maybe less polishedly played. Yeah. Yeah, going back to the 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 kind of intro lulling you into the sense of a different rock band, the I want to I want to go back to the specifically the intro here. I want to listen to that again real quick. Yeah. Just that part. Before mm-hmm. we even get into the bass, just Martin kind of like noodling and shredding very much reminds me of Don Henley's The Boys of Summer. Oh, what's that? Let's hear it. Actually, maybe the Atari's version would be a better, better version. Same general feel, that same kind of ripping guitar melting. But, but as soon as we get into the bass in this song, in I'm Your Gun, it kind of, it, it, it feels more like a tall song to me. Yes. Can we hear Martin's version one more time? Martin's sure. uh, lick one more time? Yep. I'm going to lick Martin one more time. Uh, it's really fascinating. So we get that, that first da 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 And then with that next section where he goes, <laughs> it actually, he actually slightly speeds up. And that's quite unusual for Martin because, I mean, all the musicians in Tall at this point are really have to be masters of keeping time otherwise they'd be totally off the rails because oh, yeah. of the, how, the complexity of the music they play but it sets us up with that kind of like yeah well you know we just maybe this is the first time that martin ever played it he's <laughs> like hey here's the chords just just have at just, you know just I wing it to sound like this yeah there is a i guess a freshness there uh, a kind of he was almost caught off guard it feels uh-huh. I, I i like it though I like it. It's good. It's good. It's a 4-4 four, four roller. Mm-hmm. It rolls along in 4-4. Four, four. It's a pretty rocking song. It's pretty pretty steady. After that intro, it does feel like it slows down a little bit. Yes. Just in terms yes. of pacing, but it, it does stay steady all the way through, I think. Let's talk a little bit about Ian's voice in this song. Okay. He is really working his high register. I feel like, you know, we know that at a certain point, the register starts going down. This is still, this is getting toward the 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 crest, if you will. Yeah, I actually, I'm gonna, I want to put a pin in that because I the, we've got a pertinent note 
to talk about during our halfway through here. But let's let's remember Ian's voice, 1988-87 era, and let's let's think about where where he progresses from the end of Broadsword into Under Wraps and where it, where it essentially leads us. Let's put a pertinence pin in that pony. That's that's where pertinence pins go. That's right. In, in the ponies. pertinence pin pony. That's right. <laughs> but in this song, he's really he's really kind of shout singing some of these really high notes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And again, it's fantastic. He, you know, we heard a little bit of that rough sound. And and I do think that there is an element that it is, it, it comes from being unstudied. Yeah. Ian is a perfectionist. Mm-hmm. Jethro Tull is a band which values kind of perfecting something. And all the musicians are so good that things can end up being a bit polished. Right. And let's think about the progression of the first couple of albums all the way up even into Aqualung. They were they were kind of messy. They were they were a bit sloppy. And when they got into the crazy prog concept albums, when we got uh-huh. into to Passion Play and Thick as a Brick, they had to be on top of their game. They had to be perfect with one another. So I I think that kind of is a turning point where where perfection became the the rule of the game for Jethro Tull. A necessity because of the complexity of the music they were playing, you're saying. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I also think that, you know, it, it's possible that Ian always wanted to attain that level of perfection. Oh, sure. And, you know, sometimes when you when you hear him talk about that those early days, it is... Not embarrassment exactly, but a little bit of of like, yeah, I didn't really play the flute. Yeah. I didn't really know how to play the guitar. None of us really knew how to play our instruments. Right. And it's just the logical progression if you've been playing for three years versus 30 years. Totally. And at the beginning, they were getting away on their, you know, on the image and the energy of it and the kind of jumping around. The, The chutzpah, if you will. The chutzpah, yes. I booked myself an appointment at the Hood Spa. Yeah. For later this week, yeah, because I'm very tense. You need to treat yourself every now and then, Omar. I do, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Going back to his voice, hitting that that kind of wild screaming or 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 yelling singing to get to to those peak points, I think really works perfectly with the juxtaposition of the chorus of singers in the background that is could be the other guys, could be Ian, but there's also that weird, like, synthy singing voice as well. Mellotron given voice. Yeah. It, it, it really works in this one. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and there, those voices are very much in lockstep. Yes. Yeah. What we're calling the sloppiness of this song is only remarkable because everything else during the, from this era is so tight. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and sloppiness... For lack of a better term, I guess, you know, because at this point, it's a it's got to be a conscious choice, right? Is it or is it simply that this was the third time they'd ever played it versus, you know, the stuff that ended up on the album? They rehearsed until it was. In their bones. Permeable. Yeah. Yeah, that's valid. That's really valid. Un. Uncriticable. What's the word I'm looking for? Infallible. Infallible is a good one. Un- irreproachable. Oh, oh my goodness. Typically, the music is without reproach. <laughs> that it is, despite what uh, Rolling Stone would have you believe. Despite, <laughs> listen, take that Rolling Stone magazine, dip it in a can of olive oil, and shove it down your face. That's it. That's, that's what you should do with it. For fiber. I really enjoy... I really enjoy the chorus bridge parts between the the verses and the the chorus bridge sound is they're so very different and I just love how different they are and I really like the sound it just it's very pleasing to my ear when we get into the the chorus part the match wheel and flintlock they all caught your eye just the way he sings it it's it's so like lilting and and kind of carefree and given yes. that the content of the song it's Mm -hmm. it's extra it's extra absurd i feel like he he really he really layers on the the farce here yeah that's a really interesting 
point, and I and I think that you know I'm excited to talk more about the lyrics. Mm-hmm. I think this is, you know, for being a quote unquote a flawed gem for being a bonus track. This is exceptionally well written. Oh my gosh, the poetry in this is good. And as a spoiler alert, next week's is going to be even better. I find even better, even better. But this is this is really this is a really poignant song. We'll get into it. We'll get into it. And then uh, my my final thought, my final note on just the sound, the musicality is that we talked about last week how Rhythm and Gold has a bit of the sound that we're going to be hearing in two albums, Post Under Wraps. Mm -hmm. It kind of dips into that crest catfish sound. I feel like we got a lot of that here as well. I do too. And particularly from Martin. And and is that because this song actually came out in eighty eight? Yeah, probably. Probably. They they probably noodled it before then, but it actually came out or was was pushed out after the fact. Nick, anything else to say about the musical aspects of I'm Your Gun? That's it for me. I really like it. It's funky, it's fresh, it's 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 good. It's a good return to the sound that we we enjoy without being the sound that is too overly folky, which it's a, it's a return and it's a preview. Correct. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of it's a bit of a flat circle. It's a Janus. It's a it's a it's a double headed god of a song looking in both directions. I definitely dated her in college. Yes, <laughs> yes. You you met her. Yeah. No, I yeah bo- twice. <laughs> Coming and going. On that note, let's get halfway there. <laughs> Here we are, Omen. Halfway through, we've got ourselves some notes, and I think we need to maybe address the idea of these bonus tracks, quote-unquote, that actually came out four four or five years after the album that is Broadsword. Address away. I've got two notes on our most recent episode that dropped, Mayhem Maybe. Okay. Both on uh, our YouTube. So we, we start with, from Housework Vids, this is the that crazy cry in Mayhem Maybe, that woo! Yes, yes. Housework Vids states that that is a tin whistle, almost certainly. Oh, interesting. I get it. I can hear it, knowing that now. Well, and it makes sense thematically. You know, we're kind of returning to the forest with that song. Yeah. Kind of reminds one of that earlier foresty stuff. Yes, and to go back to what we were talking earlier, Ian's vocals, his pushing his range. Yeah. We mentioned in there that he sounds, during Broadsword, the whole album, we were like, oh man, he's primo vocals right now. And then yes. in these bonus tracks, we're like, oh, he's starting to strain. Housework Vids reminds us that the vocals are from 86, 87, post Under Wraps tour, where he blew out his voice. Oh, interesting. So, So in a way, he could be... Depending on when this is being, when these were recorded. He says that he either read it in the original 20 years box or it, uh, in the liner notes somewhere or in an interview that that's when these, these bonus tracks were actually finally produced in that time period. That's really interesting. I wonder though, does that mean that they were recorded during that time period or were they just, had they already been recorded? You know, like, some of the tracks from the 20 years of Jethro Tull mm-hmm. box set were Beltane, which was, you know, from the Heavy Horses period. Sure. Too Many Two and Overhang from the Broadsword period. Right. You know, does that mean a part of the machine, for instance? Mm-hmm. Some of the stuff was from the Chateau d'Herville sessions. So it, so it they... feels like there's there's a little bit of a time period there. Yeah, but it sounds like it sounds like what what's being proposed is that possibly Ian was in recovery for having blown out his voice during the time when this song, for instance, was recorded. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. And just uh, another person, a personnel note. We talked about Jerry's drums in Mayhem. Maybe Archivos Baldo chimes in and says that Jerry was the drummer in 82 Tull. However, we got to remember this is this is post 82 this is 84 or somewhere around there Doan was our drummer most likely for mayhem maybe yeah it seems like there was a transitional period if we look at the lineup for 
Crest of a Knave, for instance, which was released in 87, both Doan Perry and Jerry Conway are featured on that album. So it seems like maybe they, maybe they were going a little bit back and forth. Really quite interesting. Interesting kind of mishmash of times here. Oh, my goodness. One more final note. Sorry to be jumping oh. all over the place. Jump, jump like a little jumping bean, Nick. Here I am, a jumping bean. From Jupson on our Discord, which you can access by becoming a $5 Patreon member. Gosh, that's so little. It's so cheap. Why aren't you doing it? Jupson provided a note right from Wikipedia that says, Mayhem Maybe, recorded at Maison Rouge, London in 1981. Vocals, flute, and whistles by Ian Anderson added at home April 1988. Whoa! Confirmed, yeah. So the idea is that they were th- either it was unfinished or they couldn't find the track that, that he had originally sung. So he, he kind of polished it up to put onto that 20 years. That's really interesting. So in, in Silent Singing, the the phrasing that he uses is, it was fascinating to mix and master this collection, kind of implying to me that it was already recorded. But by, you know, with that little fact, we see that maybe part of it was recorded at one point, part of it got recorded at another point, And they're, you know, they stitched the pieces together with the magic of sound editing. Yeah. Jupson says, so Crest slash Rock Island Ian with Broadsword era band. He went back in time. Very cool. Yeah. And that song takes us back in time. It does. To the time of the fairy folks. That's right. That is right. Very cool. Nick, anything else to say in this uh, in this sort of interlude, in this interstitial space, this moment between worlds? No, no, that is it for me. Thank you guys for all of those notes. We, uh, we greatly appreciate it. You can find a link to our Patreon in the show notes if you want to be a part of that Discord where we have some fantastic facts thrown about. Some fantastic fantasy fan facts. Fan fiction about Ian Anderson. (laughs) Gee. (laughs) It's saucy. (laughs) Okay, Omen. Oh, hi, Nick. Here we are. Fancy meeting you here. I orchestrated it years ago, and it's finally come to fruition. So let's talk... (laughs) So let's talk lyrics. I'm super excited to jump into the, the poetry of this song. Yes. This is an interesting, right off the bat, right off the trigger, we have an interesting point of view in this song, which is that yes. Ian is singing as an inanimate object. I know. I'm trying to think of, we, we've, uh-huh. got, we've got files of where songs fall at this point, of where we yes. would label them. I'm trying to think of where this would go in terms of what we've heard thus far. Right, because often we say, oh, you know, it's first person as character. Oh, it's it's um, s- third, what is it, second person, third person. You were the English major, you tell me. Third person omniscient narrator, first person fictional character, first person biographical. Right, fourth person once removed, then marriage is okay. Kissing cousin, yep. Mm-hmm. This is a little bit, I suppose this is first object, because it's not really a person. It's it's first fictional character, but it's not really fictional because it is talking about a a real... It's sort of talking about the history of an object. Yeah. You know what it reminds me of? What's that? It reminds me of a song which starts out, Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. Mm. I've been around for a long, long years. Stole million man's soul and faith. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth. I've been around for a long, long year. Stole many a man's soul and faith. Sympathy for the Devil? Sympathy for the Devil by the Rolling Stones. That's yeah. Right. It's a very similar structure in that it is a song which in which this character kind of describes their evolution through history and their effect on mankind. Interesting. Okay. But in terms of tall, that would more fall like in Kelpie or something, you know, where it's where it's a mythical, mystical creature almost. Uh-huh. But I mean, I guess Ian embodies all, or, or the, the singer, the character in here, embodies all of firearms in all of existence. So it could be almost like, like the tulpa that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. 
in that that we put so much power into something it becomes an entity all of its own well indeed and if you uh, do you recall did you ever read neil gaiman's american gods a while ago but yeah absolutely so the whole premise of that is that you know as civilization evolved human beings stopped worshiping gods like thor a god of lightning and you know the god of the sun and all this and started worshiping Things like the internet and the television and the television. And so you have all these new gods who are super slimy. Yeah. And, you know, and any, any concept that you put a lot of value into takes on a meaning and a mythos of its own in the human conscious collective, collective consciousness. And, and as the years go, and grow and and society becomes what it is of course this god is going to become more and more potent and and omnipresent goodness i mean think of the effect that firearms have had on human civilization obviously you know i think that we need to kind of preface this conversation in a way by acknowledging the all of the horrors that have that are being inflicted by people using guns or by guns using people, perhaps. Hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in America, we're at a very tense and unpleasant moment in terms of our relationship with firearms, you know, and I think that perhaps there's some sort of a, a social reckoning that is taking place, or perhaps not. Right. Yeah, to be determined. You know, if you go all the way back to when the first firearms were invented, it was a huge, huge effect on society. Yeah, just cannons alone the the adding cannons to warfare and to to ships totally you know? changed the game i mean yeah. for one thing plate mail became irrelevant <laughs> yeah think was... of all the plate mail ma- manufacturers <laughs> who were put out of business <laughs> the biggest loss i think we can acknowledge i right? think we can yeah okay so there's no multi-layer here in this song i mean the title says it all <laughs> I'm I'm your gun. He's, like it's he's do- giving it to us with that one. Does what it says on the tin. It does exactly what it says on the tin. And yet the the thought that is being conveyed is is deep and multi layered. Yeah. Blew my smoke on a sunny day when the first black powder came my way. Hot lead ball from a muzzle cold to win Lady Fair and take your gold. Blew my smoke on a sunny day. So he's really taking us back to the the black powder muzzle loader, you know, some of the very first firearms that were invented where you, you know, you had black powder, you had to put it into the into the part of the the back end of the butthole of the gun, and to put the the ball, the, you know, down the other end, and then you lit the flintlock, you know, it was literally you release the trigger and that would scrape a piece of flint across a piece of steel, making a spark igniting the powder and blasting the projectile out of the barrel. You you actually dropped the powder in the muzzle first and then you dropped your ball. And and then you used you used the ramrod to push it all down so it's good and tight. It's been a long time since I've dropped a ball. I, I guess I forgot. You you dropped the ball on dropping the ball. I sure did. Well right, and if you look, you know so the the first firearm is credited to the tenth and twelfth centuries in China called mm-hmm. the Fire Lance. Hmm. First described in text in 1132, it was a bamboo tube of gunpowder tied to a spear. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you stick it into the face of your enemy and it would blow up. Yeah, and and if you're the only one who has ever seen that, it 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 comes as quite a shock. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's that's where it all began. You know, they also made fireworks, though, so I guess there's there's that. But. Right, and then, and then of course, that evolved into, you know, what we have now, which are these very, very high tech things, where the you know the big the big evolution is that the powder now lives in the casing with the with the projectile itself. Right. So all you have to do is whack the the cartridge into there. Yeah. Just in, insert cartridge, point and shoot. 
Western Europe, you know, evolved it further, which helped Europeans kill each other in large numbers and massacre people all across the world, leading to the age of colonialism. It's uh, they, they made it so easy to, to kill people. It's great. That's the, the so that's the interesting thing with with guns and and if we and as we get further in you know it is kind of fascinating that you know you have this invention and the first thing that we see in the song that the use of it is is to win fair lady and take your gold yeah to gain power over other people that's the the fundamental thing that it is immediately credited with in this song yeah because let's be honest it wasn't invented for hunting. Well, you don't hunt with a cannon, and you certainly don't no. hunt with a fire lance, no. No. I mean, I did once, but it ended poorly. That hummingbird was very chewy. <laughs> Over, you can very easily overcook hummingbird, yeah. <laughs> One millisecond too long. One too many blasts from the, whole, from the fire lance. So my... One of my favorite, it, it, we said earlier that the, there's there's just such poetry in this song. Yeah. One of my favorite sets is, I'm the peacemaker, so the theory goes, mm. but I don't choose the company I keep, and it shows. I am the peacemaker, so the theory goes, but I don't choose the company I keep, and it shows. Yeah, there's a lot of, this almost seems to be in response to critique of firearm proliferation. Uh, It's interesting that he says, I know it hardly seems the time to talk of blue steel so sublime. I can understand your point of view. To tell the truth, I scare me too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know it hardly seems the time Yeah, I I look at what I've become. It is out of my control. I am really just a tool to be used and look at how people are using me. Yeah, I yeah, I don't choose the company I keep and it shows. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's for for being in the mid 80s, for being written in the mid 80s. It's I'm sure it was was apt then. But boy, howdy, is it a lot more poignant now. And that's one of the amazing things about good writing is that it it stays relevant. Yeah. Yeah, Regrettably, this one has stayed even more relevant. So really interesting, the timing of this in 19, you know, and I and I think that we have to we sort of have to think about this song in an American context because gun ownership in Britain has always been such a different beast. Yeah. But in the States. In 1986, there was a a law signed into, or there was a there was a an act of Congress called the Gun Control Act, and it basically increased the penalties for possessing a firearm if you were not qualified to own them under that law. Hmm. That I think since has been wiped out, probably. Uh, you know, it's been a, it's been a long evolution you know it also it also banned the uh, there was another law the law the law enforcement officers protection act which banned the possession of uh, what they called cop killer bullets which were armor piercing mm. bullets mm-hmm. and then in 88 there was a law saying that you you couldn't manufacture sell ship import possess transfer any firearm that was undetectable through walk through metal detectors hmm so there was, you know, but at the same time, there were also some laws being enacted, which which made it easier. So there's a lot of debate, you know, in this period. And it almost seems like like the the gun in this song is saying, hey, listen, I get it, but it's not mm. my fault. Yeah. Yeah, right. Right. And that that ties into the the second portion that is just. Sickening and and amazing and poetic is. Now one of me exists for each one of you, so how can you blame me for the things that I do? Wow. Now I take second place to the motor car in the score of killing kept thus far. And just remember, if you don't mind, it's not the gun that kills, but the man behind. 
Guns don't kill people. People kill people. That's exactly what I was thinking. You know, there's a there were the bumper stickers in the '90s and in the '80s and '90s that that said guns don't kill people. People kill people. Yeah, and the only way to protect f- from a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. So during the '80s and '70s and '90s and '60s, and, you know, a lot of the time of the past century, we had these cowboy movies, and and you know, America was very good at making still is quite good at making these violent action movies where you have the bad guy who's all armed to the teeth mm-hmm. walking sauntering into town with his with his sexy black leather and looking to looking to cause some trouble and then John Wayne comes in and stops him through his manly use of the same techniques <laughs> <laughs> yes but he kills the bad guys not the innocents yeah sure sure so it's okay. Yeah. Right. Well, and I remember a cowboy movie that I watched one time. I forget what it was called. It was one of those old classic movies. And they're in a gunfight and there's some young kid who's his, you know, it's his first gun gunfight. One of the old hands shoots one of the bandits and the bandit screams and falls off this big cliff. Mm-hmm. And the guy says, remember kid, it's not the bullet that kills you. It's the fall. Yeah. And it's interesting. I feel like that was, that was actually perhaps a censorship, a way to get around censorship that some movies you know, oh. during periods you weren't allowed to, you weren't allowed to show someone getting killed by a bullet, but you could shoot him and have him fall off a cliff. Yeah. Right. You don't actually see the death. You're left to, it, it's left to your imagination. Yeah. Just barely. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Barely makes sense, but it makes sense. There's also in this song, this amazing kind of the view of, of seduction almost. Match, wheel, and flintlock, they all caught your eye. Pearl-handled ladies' models scaled down to size. Love me, I'm your gun. Match, wheel, and flintlock, they all caught your eye. Pearl-handled ladies' models scaled down to size. Love me, I'm your gun. So the gun is inadvertently seducing mankind? Yeah. And and I think that, that that is often the case. We are, as human beings, seduced by our own creations. Pygmalion, yeah. Oh, that's a great way of saying it. Yeah, Pygmalion and Galatea, right? The, the sculptor who sculpted a sculpture so beautiful he fell in love with it and then it begged Aphrodite to turn her into a real human, and she did. And nothing went wrong ever again in that relationship. Every, every Greek myth turns out great. <laughs> They actually did okay. Their kids were messed up. Goo. Half stone. Um, half, half stoned. Yeah. But, you know, if you think about cars, Ian mentions cars in this. Or even if you look at, you know, if you go back to one of my favorites, four-wheel drive. Mm-hmm. You have this, you know, you have this, this relationship with this machine. Yeah. This sort of sensual, sensuous, sexualized relationship that we have a little bit of, you know, that same aspect here. Yeah. The description of, of the gun is, is very alluring. Yeah, it is. It's just so icky to me. I, I wish I, I love, I love how icky it is. Mm -hmm. And I love the music. I love the poetry. I love an ick. I I love a good ick every now and then. It's just, it's just darn it. It just, I mean, it's, I, I feel like it's supposed to make me feel this way. (sighs) Maybe because I, I don't know. I don't know. It just, just given, given current circumstances, it is, it is what it is. I mean, it, it, it does its job well. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough one. And, and it's interesting to, you know, it's interesting Ian giving voice to the object because of course the object is just an object. Right. But at the same time, the object is 
a part of a system which is designed by people. Maxim and Browning, they helped me along. Stoner Kalashnikov thrilled to my song. Maxim and Browning, they helped me along. Stoner Kalashnikov thrilled to my song. These aren't, you know, an object is just a collection of metal, of metal parts. A gun is just, you know, some some dirt that somebody made, got out of the ground and cooked it in the oven, and, and there it is. Right put in some brass and put some wood on it and, you know, made it look pretty. So, right, how can you say that this object is the problem? What the problem is, is that someone thought of making that object and then did it. And the design and intention behind that object. Yeah, the the intention in the, in the creation could be the purest there is. Sure. But the 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 usage of it i mean it's it's fission it's nuclear fission it's the same thing you made the point that gunpowder was invented originally or at least at the same time for the use of fireworks mm-hmm. so right fireworks fantastic we like to go and watch them it's delightful something for the kids but as soon as that invention exists someone's thought is oh wow i could use this to defend my homeland or go destroy someone's homeland. (laughs) Yeah. It's, I mean, it's human nature. It is, it's lizard brain of how can I be stronger than my enemies, quote unquote, the, the threats that are, whether they're real or not. I mean, you want to be prepared, I guess. So, so it's, it's, it's human nature to take anything, even as, as innocent as it was to take anything you, you can to, to defend yourself, to use against someone or something else. Well, you know, for instance, Kalashnikov, we associate the name with, with the, the AK-47, mm-hmm. the AK-74, the AK-47, all, both of those. But he was a human being. He, if you look up his, you know, his article on on Wikipedia, one of the first things that it says is, even though Kalashnikov felt sorrow at the weapon's uncontrolled distribution, he took pride in his inventions and their reputation for reliability, emphasizing that his rifle is a weapon of defense, not a weapon for offense. That sounds like the NRA. That sounds like every <laughs> yeah. goddamn excuse I've ever heard. Well, and the fact is, as soon as you invent it and put it out there in the world, you can't control what other people do with it. You can't control the company it keeps. Yeah. He also was a poet. Kalashnikov was? Kalashnikov was a poet. Doesn't make up for it, but thanks. (laughs) All of his poetry was very loud. (laughs) Just screaming in bursts. Yeah. Nick, anything else to say about I'm Your Gun before we really whittle ourselves into a steep depression here? No, no, no. Good song, all all things considered. Good song. Good song, bad object. Yes, bad. Bad object. Bad. Bad object. Bad human thoughts that created that object. Bad system of warfare. Omen, next week is our final track from Broadsword and the Beast. What? Our final bonus track? What will we ever do? We'll move on to Under Wraps. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Doc Savage has been champing at the bit for this, I know. (laughs) What is the final track? What is the final bonus track off of the Broadsword album experience, Nick McGill? Down at the End of Your Road. Oh, well, until next week, when we find out what that is, if you want to win a Lady Fair, we can take your gold when you join our Patreon group and impress all of your friends. We can't choose the company we keep. And it shows. When you rate and review our podcast and give us five stars on your pod system of choice, then you can improve the company we keep by enlarging it. <laughs> Nick, I, I've never seen We're you. Done. I've never seen your face fall so much. I'm, I'm just disappointed in myself. Woman. <laughs> to tell the truth, Nick, I scare me too. Until next week.
I am the theoretical peacemaker, Nick McGill. I am the blue steel so sublime, Omen Thomas said. Now only one of us exists, the feckless moms. And how can you blame us for the things that we, Talk Tall to Me, do? Thank you, comrade. And next we have Sergei Yenin, here to read a poem. Here it's the Glass Onion uh, Nightly Poetry Fest Jam Session. Yes. Uh, raise your vodkas high and shake out your, your fur hats for next poet. Yes. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. This is called The Birch Tree. Ugh, I can't. I can't wait. I love birch trees. Shut up, Sergi! <clears throat> Under my window, tucked in the snow, white birch retired, clad in silver glow. On the fluffy branches, snowy trim with silver tinge, melted round catkins forming white fringe. Like golden fires, snowflakes blazed, while birch stood still asleep or amazed. Meanwhile, lazily strolling around, dawn threw more silver, on the twigs and ground. Oh, yes, that was net bad. Oh, I have not been so moved since my days at the Izvisk State Technical University. Oh, and now we have a very special first time poet, uh, Mr. Kalashnikov. Okay, uh, hi, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, this is my first set of poems, and this one is called... Um, uh, the patina on a piece of 440 steel. It is about my love. <clears throat> pow! Pow, pow, pow! Bang, bang! Bang, bang, pow, snap! Snap, crackle! A pop, 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 pop! A pow, 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 pow! Zing! Zippity, zing! Bang, 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 bang! Bang, bang, bang! Bing, 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 bing! Ooh. Bing, bing! Bing bing! Boo! Uh, that was verse two. First, I have one more poem. Thank you for your support, comrades. Uh, this is next poem is called The Smell You Get on Your Fingers When You've Been Working in the Machining Shop All Day and You Have Invented a Better Version of a Small Bullet. Woo! <clears throat> spow, 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 spow! Clackety, 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 click! A kip pow pow pow, a kip pow pow, a kip pow 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 pow, zing 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 zing, boom, a boom 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 boom goes my heart. Thank you. Okay, I have one more one more poem about uh, about my work. It's a very small poem. It's called "What I Listen to When I Am Venting Even More Efficient Instruments of Death." In my hand, I have death. In my eyes, I have death. Under my feet, I have, you guessed it, death. In my brain, I have a death. But in my ears, I have Tok Tol to me, which is a proud member of the Feckless Moms Audio Network. Okay, thank you, Mikael. Thank you, Don, to come back. <laughs> 